content pieces and kind of create more trust and more authority um, to kind of organize all of that content. That's right. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have been trying to organize Twitter, bringing trust to it, bringing, uh, filtering the noise, uh, and this right. was one company that did that um, and had a significant success for a number of years, um, several years ago. Okay, great. Cool. So I never wanted to start a company. <laughs> never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was a foreign correspondent. Um, I was honored and really lucky to be somebody who was paid to travel to places and explain to an audience back home in Ireland, where I came from, what was going on. One of the stories that captivated me, and any foreign correspondent in the room or someone who's traveled reporting will know, there's always one story that gets under your skin. For me, it was Iran. So I watched and chronicled the journey from, of Iran from about 2001 all the way through um, and watched a young generation being given the promise of democracy. At the very moment that I thought that this would be, you know, a crowning moment was the elections of 2009. If you remember the Green Revolution where kids went out, protested a disputed election on the streets of Tehran. Now, I normally would have been there, but my own company was a public broadcaster, RTE, was cash strapped, we couldn't send me. I sat at home looking at Twitter and looking at all these, this information and I was listening to the television. It was a very famous British correspondent saying, he was in his hotel room and he was phoning back to the news and he was here. He said, rumors are coming in that's been shootings on Valley Asser Street, which is the street going through northern Tehran. I was in Dublin, sitting at home watching Twitter. I could see the bodies of the protesters who been shot dead, being brought out of Valley Asser Square. He was quoting third-hand reports from Tehran. I was seeing through Twitter first-hand testimony that was so much more authentic and raw than anything I had seen from you know, this event. And that was it. I said, holy shit, something's happened. First of all, scared because it meant that foreign correspondents were no longer needed, right? Because everybody with their phone and a connection to a social network like Twitter could be a reporter. But also an opportunity, and very much like Josh. The problem is there's just way too much going on. If everybody's a storyteller, who do you listen to? And that was the inspiration, much like with Sulia, behind Storyful, that we would find the wisdom in the crowd that could tell us something that was true and authentic. And uh, that's what I did. We went ahead and a week later, by the way, I was at a wedding um, and I was standing at the, the bar in the west of Ireland and I also saw the, you know, the kids, 20-somethings, gathering on their phones. And they're like, what's happening? Michael Jackson just died. How do you know Michael Jackson died? It's not in the news. But Twitter's telling us. So sure enough, half an hour later, we're dancing, myself and my mother at one point, a thriller. This is a half an hour before the LA Times reported his death. And that was the second part, was the danger of false information, of you know, killing people off on Twitter before it actually happens. So the fear of fake news, which before fake news existed, was the secondary challenge, which was to verify the wisdom in the crowd. And those two problems came together to compel me, almost like a virus, an infection, to go and start a company. So both in what you said and what Josh said, I, I, I feel like there's a common thread of basically uh, for every startup entrepreneur, and I, I don't know any who's actually like into, especially in media, okay, my future is just to create a company, let's start a company. No, it's more about observing the reality around you, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and basically come, come to realize that some, there's an opportunity, but at the same time, things are not as perfect, are not as you know, uh, good as they should be, so that you come to the conclusion, okay, there's some, Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to fix this, right? And, and kind of, you know, bring order to chaos, curating content, um, be it in a way to, like, build more trust, which I think it's, you know, uh, so important right now. Um, and, um, you know, for me, uh, when I started WatchUp, there was a lot of, uh, like, first of all, as a consumer, I wanted the place where I could watch all of the best video news content for me, in a way that was, I, I didn't have to, you know, constantly interact with the, with the device, but it would more be like a lean back experience. And then there was also, personally, a lot of, uh, like, coming back to 
uh, an initial passion that I got for journalism actually when I was a kid and I still remember watching uh, the first newscast I can remember, the first telegiornale, and it was about the Berlin Wall falling down. I was just nine years old, and uh, I told my mother, uh, you know, I want to become a journalist. And then the next day, I actually became an entrepreneur because I, I went to school and realized that most of my classmates hadn't heard about the news, and so I decided to scribble down a small newspaper that I sold for 500 lire. Uh, at the time, uh, until we got caught by the Catholic teacher who, of course, in Italy said, hey, stop it, you guys are making money, which is a sin, you, you cannot do that at school. Uh, so instead of, you know, getting a reward for that, we got reprimanded. Uh, probably at that time, I discovered uh, unconsciously at least that I should leave the country uh, if I wanted you know, to be serious about uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, but of course, as an Italian, you know, I keep with me a lot of that uh, you know, creativity and, and you know, uh, will to, to, to be creative in, in this business. And, and for WatchUp, it was also about trying to go beyond, you know, there was a boom of digital video. So we founded the company in 2012, um, so um, uh, we wanted to, um, you know, very much like you, Josh, bring a little bit more of order into the chaos, and instead of building yet another video platform, it was especially for the iPad back then, that there was like all sorts of like video apps popping up and, and leveraging YouTube that would give you access to just any and all videos to just give you the best la creme de la creme in terms of video news content because there was already, I think, a lot of uh, like availability of any sort of news content, but without that necessary screening and, and filtering of just finding the best sources for you. Um, okay, so we spoke a little bit about the motivation. Now I'd love to hear, uh, you know, perhaps some stories about uh, the, the startup journey how did you guys go about, because you mentioned, for instance, Mark, and maybe we can start with you this time. Um, you mentioned the fact that you didn't want to be an entrepreneur in the first place, you just wanted to fix the problem, right? So how did you go about, you know, creating the company and, you know, hiring people, and uh, how did you figure that out? Um, with great difficulty and a lot of embarrassment, some shame, um, pain, um, disbelief of colleagues. I had friends saying to me, I think you're having a nervous breakdown. Um, midlife crisis, all that kind of stuff. So the very first day I remember uh, walking into this little small office that I had rented. I was on my own, there was only one person, me. And I went up and I was mapping my business plan on the whiteboard and I realized I was using permanent markers. Uh, and I just spent the rest of the afternoon scrubbing off, uh, thinking is this how Mark Zuckerberg you know, started out. But there was a lot of uh, naivete. I think the key issues is, first of all, first of all, it's vision. And clearly, you have to be, as the founder, the custodian of the vision. But very quickly, you realize you can't do this without other people. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Gavin Sheridan, my colleague, my first colleague is right down the back there. We went and got drunk together in the, in the city of Cork in Ireland. And I think we mapped out the future of Storyful on a napkin in a bar. And then the next day, we forgot what we described. But, you know, Gavin and myself, as the early members of the team, with more people coming on, we just sit there and try and do and fail and learn. And, and through that rapid, what in retrospect I now know, having studied product development cycles, is called agile development, which basically means fail quickly. Uh, do it with people who are unlike you in other ways, right? So you don't surround people like yourself, you surround people who will challenge you. And out of that begins to emerge a culture. And so a culture, I know, is a much maligned and misunderstood uh, word and concept, but what it is really is the shorthand that a small group of people use in every single decision they make in every single day to inform themselves almost without communicating. So I remember the first day our CTO used the phrase, he said to me, I said something, he said, that's not very storyful. And when your culture becomes like an adjective, you understand that everybody in the room can go away and do their things without you micromanaging them because they have instilled in themselves a kind of almost, as I say, language of your company. And that comes about through shared pain. It comes about sometimes um, through just, you know, things you learn in muscle memory. And so a startup really is a million different decisions of which maybe 50.0001 go the right way. And that's the difference between success and failure. So vision first, team, and then culture emerges out of the right team. And then that becomes almost like your, as I say, muscle memory that informs the different things you do every day without thinking. 
That's great. And, and so what was, uh, what defined the storyful as an adjective for you and how did you go about um, shaping that? And, and, and then uh, also, I'm curious, uh, did you ever see that changing over time? It's a great question. I, a lot of it came out of a shared understanding of the problem. Um, so journalism, and I think you have to remember, today is very different than 2010. I think you'll agree, Josh. I mean, in the last eight years, we've seen, even the fact that we're having this session at all, the idea of journalists being entrepreneurs, that was kind of a ridiculous concept, even back in 2009. So in many ways, I remember one of our, our managing editor, a guy called Malachi Brown, he went to a conference like this, and he described Storyful as kind of the X-Men of journalism. I'm sorry for the sexist terminology there, but the X so mutants. We were all sort of journalists, but with slightly sort of elevated weird superpowers, <laughs> whether it be, in Gavin's case, it was data journalism, he was the first blogger in Ireland, or in my case, it was foreign correspondency. So I think essentially what described us was people who thought like builders and innovators and creators, as opposed to what generally defines journalists, which is observers, people who sit back and judge. And I think that was very much the culture of our time. Did it change? It changes as we added people. The biggest mistake I made as an entrepreneur was assuming that my culture needed a shock to the system from someone in sales or... So I hired like a shit kicking salesperson who came in, didn't get the culture, and I realized I made the wrong hire. Um, and so you do actually have to, in the end of the day, part company with a lot of people. So if your vision is being changed because your team, you know, you're hiring against yourself, then uh, you've, you've, that's a potential fatal mortal moment. Um, if your culture changes without you knowing it. It's great to hear. Uh, Josh, for you, so can you tell us some, some stories about that startup journey? How did you go about putting the company together? What was the cu culture like? Uh, and so on. Let's see. Here's an example from the company I'm currently working on. It's just me and uh, a CTO. So we uh, build messaging apps for professional communities. Uh, at the center of each messaging app, we have a team of anchors. Those anchors include um, journalists. So we launched an app on the subject of salumi or charcuterie uh, last fall. Hmm. It happens to be a passion of mine. So sure. um, I found, a, well, I had a friend who's uh, very well known in the States for charcuterie. Um, he wrote a book on it. Um, and we said, okay, what we're going to do is he's going to have this app. It's going to look like a messaging app, but he's going to put journalism in it. And that's a great um, environment in which to have a conversation. So his sort of stuff that you might call content could transition easily to conversation. And one of the sort of big mega trends that we believe in is that there's sort of a collapse of content and conversation in the world today and that we wanted to sort of um, further that uh, trend. So... Um, we launched this app called Charcuterie. And, and uh, sorry, what, what do you mean by collapse of the content and conversation? I mean, um, the, a convergence of the two. Uh, uh, uh. Um, uh, Twitter's a good example. Like, if you look at a tweet or a series of tweets, it's not clear whether that's content, like, uh, is in the kind of stuff that's traditionally professionally okay, okay. Uh, programmed or produced, or whether it's sort of a verbal back and forth, right? Twitter is a good example of some tweets gotcha. are just the headline of the article, and some are people chatting back and forth. Um, and one of the reasons I think Twitter works really well as a product is that it, um, its product can uh, support both of those modalities. Um, so that was one of the um, threads for this product that we've, with, that we've, we've built. So we launched this product called Charcuterie, and uh, we had this guy uh, at the center of it, same as Michael Roman. He had a bunch of Twitter followers. So the idea is that he would be able to attract people who are really passionate about the subject. And because of um, his the trust that he already had on that subject, he would be able to inspire people to pay for membership. So you pay five bucks a month, and you get access to this community of people who are all super passionate about this subject with conversations being um, sparked and curated by this guy and his team. Um, so we positioned it, um, or advertised, sort of marketed it to charcuterie obsessives, and what we found very quickly is that uh, three quarters of the people who signed up were um, identified as professionals. So they they were a butcher, and they had, they did some charcuterie stuff, or they were actually a, a charcuterie professional. Versus consumers, right? They were not really consumers; they were more like on the producer side. Exactly, like, exactly. Like they pros. were pros, right? Yeah. Right. 
Um, and we realized that um, they were, their information needs and their networking needs were much different from those that we had um, sort of designed this for. This guy, Michael Rollman, um, he's, um, he's, he's written like 20 books, he's, but he, and he's a well-known personality, um, but he's not like um, the world's most famous, like he's not a charcutier. Um, so he, personally like wasn't that great at dealing with the people who had signed up. And in the meantime, these people who had signed up were paying only $5 a month and wanting uh, much more information and interaction than um, $5 could support. So this is an example of a startup launching something and learning pretty quickly that, it did, that something was off. So um, uh, we've uh, basically shut down that app where we found new anchor for it. Uh, somebody who's much more knowledgeable, who is a practitioner, who is a professional, and we'll relaunch that. And, uh, and in addition, all the apps in, that we'll launch going forward will be focused on professionals. So that was like, that was just a really good example of like, we built it really quickly um, in three or four months, um, just an iPhone app. Um, I won't go into all the uh, design and technological sacrifices we made. Um, uh, but... Uh, and then we learned very quickly in a couple months that we had like totally mispositioned this thing and needed to shut it down and relaunch it. And that's, you know, I'm in the middle of that. So, and it currently is very painful. Josh, and do you have any technical background yourself? I didn't, I'm not doing any of the programming for this company, but I do have a technical background. Okay, okay. Yeah. Lucky, lucky you, because I think that, you know, one, one of the, at, at least for me, uh, being a founder of, uh, of a, what essentially was a software product, um, I always found probably one of the hardest things to do was to, um, you know, design a product that I would actually not make myself. Yep. And the analogy that I often do is like if you are uh, the owner of a pizzeria, but you don't have a clue about how to make pizza. Uh, that's completely doable. You know, you just hire a good, uh, you know, pizzaiolo. But the catch is that with pizza, you can have a sense, especially if you are Napolitan, to, you know, what, you know, what is the right flower, you know, you know a thing or two about what doppio zero means, etc. With code, it's hungry. so hard. Huh? I'm getting hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Charcuterie and pizza. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, so, and so you, you really have to be smart about you know, the way you, you go about it, because of course it would be so hard and so, I, I think, time consuming to just learn everything you can possibly do, but you have to get to a point where although you cannot make the dough uh, of the pizza, you can at least understand, you know, the ingredients so that when there is a conversation about Python versus Node.js, for instance, you can at least, you know, ponderate, you know, what are the pros and the cons, because, you know, the truth is that, like, for instance, the choice about which programming language or framework to pick is going to have a huge impact on the business. And, um, and so, you know, the, in the Valley, there, there's a lot of chatter about, you know, can you really be like an effective non-technical founder of, uh, you know, what essentially is a, a software uh, company? Uh, the, the reality is that it, it's quite hard. What do you guys think? Well, suppose I'm not a product of the Valley, and nor I'm a technical person. Um, I have worked for Silicon Valley companies. I work for Twitter. Um, I was obviously, you know, pitching to Silicon Valley investors. I was competing against Silicon Valley companies. I have to say I draw a very strong counterpoint between a European style of innovation and a Silicon Valley innovation. Um, I do think that, I mean, being an entrepreneur is an absolute management of contradictions. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got to be absolutely certain you're going to succeed, but only 20% of companies succeed, right? So you know that you've got to also be realistic about your chances. You've got to tell people you're an absolute shoe in, you're going to, it's going to happen for you, but deep down you're kind of lying to everybody. Um, you go to an investor, you show them a hockey stick at the end of three years that shows your profitability is going to go through the roof. You know that they know that you know that they know that you know it's all bullshit, right? But you just have to go through this. And so after a while, you just get used to the concept. It's not lying, it's just parallel alternative facts, let's put it that way. <laughs> so sometimes you can know too much about a subject. Because you walk into, I remember this vividly, going into news organizations. We were uh, what we call an enterprise product, B2B. We weren't going to the consumer. So we were selling to executives, people who 
um, had a problem, we wanted to convince them we had a solution, and we'd sit down, and I could say sometimes you could actually see their eyes glazing over as we would explain why user-generated content is going to be the wave of the future. They're just thinking about, can you get me more page views, um, money, and you're saying, no, you don't understand, like, we, you, you're going to be here, you're going to do this in three years' time, like, Insulia was ahead of its time, and knowing what you did at the time was, like, break things down, managing information overload, which is the way of the future for journalism. But if you know things too much, you assume they know it too. And I think sometimes you don't have to be the best. In fact, sometimes it's not the smartest people in the room who are the CEO. <laughs> Certainly in my case, that was the case. Uh, I wasn't the smartest person. And sometimes I think you do um, get too caught up in the Silicon Valley bullshit. Like there's a great uh, podcast called Startup, which you guys have probably all heard of. It's a, a guy who sets up his podcasting company, Gimlet. I don't know if you know. That I, I love that startup, but I, or that podcast, but I also hate it because he ultimately raised money so easily. I know. He, it's, it is. He started, and this, but the second episode, Fourth he's... Fourth episode, he's got a million dollars from Chris Saka. <laughs> yeah, he's pitching to Chris Saka. I don't know Chris Saka. He is one of the early founders, or investors in Twitter, etc. And he's on the phone to his wife. The concept is the guy's decided to leave his start, his, his safe journalism job at NPR, and he's going to record every single moment of his journey. That, Gimlet Media, right? Gimlet Media. Yeah. Second episode, he's just pitched this guy, Chris Saka, on the way to his Uber taxi. And Saka's basically said, eh, it's not big enough. And he's on his phone to his wife saying, but this is the biggest thing I ever did in my life. It's not big enough for him. And there is that contradiction sometimes, that it's the biggest thing. I don't know how many people here will consider a startup. But you may have a small problem you're trying to solve. And for you, it's huge. And it will make an impact. You won't be a unicorn. You're not going to get up at some tech founder summit and be celebrated in years to come. You may not earn a huge eight times you know, return for your investors. And that's okay. You don't have to be Zuckerberg or Dorsey. You've got to solve a problem, you've got to make money for it, and you've got to basically, in some ways, I hope, make a difference. And sometimes Silicon Valley can give you a false sense of A, your own importance, but B, also your lack of importance. Um, so be very careful about buying into the foosball tables and the billion dollar valuations and you know we got loads of customers but no revenue um because they're all the roads to not just failure but madness yeah and and so when we uh so we uh, we built watch up started in 2012 and we sold the company uh last december so we, we announced that and of course um you know my being italian you know the italian press reached out hey tell us about it etc and so they published articles on you know several outlets and and of course a lot of you know fellow Italian wannabe entrepreneurs started reaching out and and I think I, like a common thread you know in those requests for help for information etc which I always try to answer in a way or the other uh, we're starting from a lot of false assumptions like a lot of that alternative reality, alternative facts, uh, which is basically the fact that Silicon Valley is that uh, El Dorado, that perfect land where you come and you have you know, investors you know, begging you to uh, take their money and you can find a lot of engineers who would you know, come on board, be on, you know, on your team to build that wonderful idea that you got. And, and I think that there, if there is one thing that uh, you know, those people who are reaching out to me got completely wrong is also the importance of the idea. I think that we are very much an idealistic uh, nation and probably continent. I think that we glorify uh, ideas uh, a lot, uh, probably more than what they are actually worth. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, ideas are important and they are kind of the seed but you cannot make a tree with just a seed, right? Uh, you need the very good, uh, you know, earth, and you need to put the water at the right time. Sometimes if you put too much water, it doesn't work, and you have to get the right climate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think that is very important because uh, you can have all the best ideas you want, but if you're not able to execute and, uh, you know, create the actual product, you're not going to go anywhere, right? Um, I think I think a, a one plank of a of a of the pitch to a VC, if that's how we want to frame this, has to be that it can be big. 
to, to, to your point about Gimlet Media. Um, so uh, I, I think of the idea as like a necessary condition and, and specifically that it has to be some theory about how it can be massively large. This is specifically from a VC uh, venture capital perspective. Um, uh, other than that, um, uh, the, you're absolutely right that the way to think about it and the way, the way I think about it is um, how many people used our thing last week and today and uh, is that going up over time? And uh, venture investors think about it the exact same way. Um, it, it, like really, really very simply, like uh, do they call it tracks, tractions, the, the word yes. that you'll hear in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And uh, it doesn't matter. Um, can, can you define traction for, for the audience? Uh, it's specific to the, um, to the product or service you have. So um, for a consumer facing product, it's probably how many people are using it monthly or weekly or daily. Um, for um, a B2B product, it might be you know, revenue um, or you know, whatever. Uh, whatever other sort of like metric that you really care about, um, and 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 a, and a, it, that's really like the, the the start and the finish of conversations. I mean, people raise or don't raise uh, rounds, especially seed rounds and and uh, Series A rounds. With like, you know, do you have like a ten thousand people using this thing or a hundred thousand people using this thing? And the difference, even if uh, it's not what you want your product to be a year from now. It can make all the difference. Great. Okay, so I would like to, uh, uh, while we continue the conversation, tell you that we are all for questions. So if you guys want to uh, come to the conversation. Could, could I ask maybe yes. how many people in the room have either started a company, want to start a company, or may decide to start a company? Great. I, I just think I wanted to check that because I think ultimately mm. sort of lets us know there may be more practical stuff yeah, if there yeah, is. Yeah. So, so perhaps you, you touched a little bit on the fundraising uh, part. Um, uh, Mark, you want, you want to talk a little bit about your fundraising experience? Yeah, um, I, th I think again, one of the things I noticed early on was um, there's a lot of things that you do, you assume you have to do, that investors actually don't need. Um, so investors don't want all the answers. They don't want you to have you know, basically solved every single problem that you may encounter in your first three to four years. They want you to have asked every single question. They want you to have anticipated the different outcomes that can happen because your idea day one is not gonna be your idea three years hence. And so the best ever advice I got was my first, my lead investor was a guy who had formed a company called Hostel World. He went on to invest in a company called Skyscanner, which you might be aware of. Skyscanner, and he, yeah. Skyscanner yeah. He sat me down in a coffee shop and he said, right, uh, in three years time, you're gonna be worth this amount, I'm gonna earn this amount to the company, and I think you're gonna to sell to these guys. And he had about three or four companies. He was six months out. But what he had done is he said, listen, everything I do, I go into it with a nirvana. What's the nirvana out of this uh, decision I'm going to make, whether it's to invest in the company, start the company. And then I work out every single thing that could happen on the way to nirvana, and decide if I have to take a left turn or a right turn, what that might be. I don't know the answers, I just know I've asked the questions. So if I give you this money, um, obviously addressable market. What's the size of the market you're going after? What are people buying about you? When are you mission critical, i.e. people couldn't do without you? You're not just a nice to have, or they'd buy you if they have enough money in their pocket. But you're must, so that was the first thing I decided that um, I realized that they don't necessarily want you to have set down an exact figure of sort of three years hence. They just want to know how you're going to get there and what happens if something doesn't go right. The second thing was domain experience, particularly for media startups. You need to have investors choose them wisely because if they don't understand your business, they'll use the comparison of, let's say, if they're in advertising or if they've been in deep tech, they'll use a different business to judge your success or failure, and that is so dangerous. They'll sit down and say, why aren't you a dot-com? Well, because I'm actually selling to other businesses. I'm not going to be a... Uh, big multiple. Um, and the next thing to understand as well is that as a media startup, it's very different because you're generally mixing two, not just cultures, but personality types. Mm -hmm. Your engineers, the technical people on your team are kind of pretty much like, they almost have a form of Asperger's. They're kind of very focused on things in front of them. They'll solve problems. The journalists, the media people are generally kind of attention deficit disorder, right? <laughs> you know, there's great, oh, there's a shiny thing over there and they, they're missing the execution of the idea. And to marry those two cultures and mindsets together is the absolute core of what you will do as a media innovator. 
Because when they do add together, they are more than the sum of the parts. And that's why I'm a big believer in this concept of agile development. Take people from different parts of your business, bring them together, small groups, with a general idea where you're going, but a constant process of iteration and failure and learning and doing it again, like your charcuterie example. That's more important than ever, I think, for media companies. And if you get the wrong investor, they will not get that concept. So choose your investors almost the way that you think they're going to choose you. Final point, you start off at the back of your brain in your amygdala, your lizard brain as they call it. It's where when you were basically, your ancestors were running away from dinosaurs, fight or flight. That's what governs your mind in the early days. You're paranoid, you're, everything's a threat to you, you literally are reacting with instinct. You need to get into the front of your brain from where optimism and idealism and clear thinking come from. And that requires you to, to confront your worst fear and realize it's okay. I was driving home to my family's uh, home in the west of Ireland one Christmas Eve. I'd refused investment that morning. My business was over as far as I was concerned. I didn't tell my wife until halfway through the journey. And she said, it's okay, you'll get a job somewhere else. And by the time I got to the house, I got a call from the lead investor to say, I'm not, I'm not taking no for an answer. Here's the money. The business was back on again. Confronted my worst fear, Christmas Eve, you know, um, and it was okay. And from then on, that was a real liberation for me. And after that, I didn't really have a great deal of fear about the journey. That sounds like some sort of movie. <laughs> Miracle on 34th Street. So, um, I think th those stories are, are great because um, we're, we're trying, I think, the, doing this exercise to kind of give you guys, share with you, especially with people who want to start a business in the media space, uh, you know, some rules of thumb in a sense, but also some stories and anecdotes that, that we can share. So, for me, I, so I came to the US, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, 2010, on a night journalism fellowship at Stanford. Uh, stay there one year, and then I joined Startex, which is the Stanford Startup Accelerator, as an entrepreneur in residence. And uh, I didn't have the idea for WatchUp yet. I was, you know, simply hanging out with other people who wanted to start their company, kind of share my experience previously in what I had built uh, in Europe. And and then I got the idea for WatchUp, and of course, you know, I I had a family. I had a, a wife. I have uh, two kids. Uh, to support in one of the most expensive parts of the world. And so I wasn't exactly that type of bohemian type who can, you know, uh, you know uh, run on a dime, etc. No, we were, you know, living in Palo Alto. And so, of course, I had to, you know, figure out how can we bootstrap, and bootstrap means to basically build something without any money. Um, and, and so what I did was to, you know, do several things. So one... And that, that was, you know, one of the very first things that I understood while being at Startex, surrounded by all of those awesome startups, was that uh, before even you get started with investors, you have to find a good lawyer. <laughs> and, and, and that lawyer can basically guide you through the process so that you can really use all of your weapons, you know, even before finding financial resources. Uh, good news is that you have Delaware corporate law that is on your site. And so you can create a, a company, usually a Delaware corporation, although you're based in California, and basically leverage a lot of things in order to basically um, give shares of a pie that actually doesn't exist yet, right? Um, because we, there was no value. Like it was all here in my brain. I don't know if in the back, in the front, but somewhere. <laughs> And I had to share a little bit of that with somebody. And, but they always said, hey, no problem, you just give uh, the options. So they, they figured that out. And so I found a technical co-founder who basically worked for seven months without being paid and who built the initial app. And you know, to your point of the traction, basically the traction thing, that is so important for investors because it's, you know, th th there's hardly uh, one meeting that I got that ended up in Here's the check. There wasn't, in fact. There it was just several meetings where, and, and, you know, sometimes sp spaced uh, of like two weeks between one and the other. And if you had to show something that you had done in those two weeks, you couldn't just say, oh, I went to San Francisco, it was fine, and I found a great pizzeria. No, you had to really, you know, give some data, some numbers, some hires that you had done, some early partnerships, uh, uh, intents, and, and stuff like that. So putting all of that together, 
uh, but it was painful. I mean, just to give you an idea, I probably contacted of the funnel, right? For that first round, we raised half a million dollars. I contacted about a thousand investors, got probably 100 meetings, and ended up having 11 checks. So it was, you know, all like, okay, 10%, 10%, 10%. And uh, all of the first 30, 40 meetings were all no's. So all slaps in the face, one after the other. No, boom, no, boom, no, boom. So a lot of people, you know, of course, and I get a lot of emails and I follow a lot of entrepreneurs, and they would have just given up. And so for me, it was, no, I know that this is the right thing to do. I, I, un I understand the market. I know that there's going to be a need for that. I know this is a good idea. But at the same time, so you have to have that tenacity and, as they put it, thick skin. No? Um, but at the same time, you also have to be very adaptable and very receptive to all of those feedbacks so that my pitch in reality, looking back, was never the same you know, from an investor to another. Because first of all, I would do a lot of homework, understand what those investors really cared about, the companies they had invested in before, probably had talked to somebody who had received money from them, if I really wanted them. And, and more importantly, after getting all of those no's, you know, I kind of try to find you know, what was that thing that was really missing and it was really, really important. So I would say a lot of tenacity, a lot of, uh, um, at the same time, flexibility, and kind of, you know, seeing where you want to go uh, no matter what. Um, okay. Any questions or... Uh, ideas you guys wanted to share or simply experiences if you have your own like painful experience you want to share I, I said that as soon as I pronounced the name pain uh, somebody <laughs> raised his hand okay speaking of pain uh, you mentioned how important it is when you when you speak to investors to address what kind of customer pain you're actually solving or trying to solve with your media startup and what I've learned from my own experience and also from a lot of uh, would-be entrepreneurs I know is that it comes to explaining uh, what pain you actually solve when you're doing a journalism startup, it oftentimes just boils down to, yeah, we're doing reporting, and they say, yeah, but other people do reporting as well, and then you say, yeah, but we do the better reporting. So this is the one special kind of reporting that we just hope people won't be able to do without, but that is a very hard point to sail, and, um, but if you look at um, highly regarded uh, media outlets like the New York Times, I mean, what is the pain they are solving there? A highly regarded um, a news outlet that does excellent reporting, but that's about it. And you can maybe list some features. So, um, in, in, in your experience, uh, in your opinion, do you think there is room in the investors' market for, for media startups to basically just try to sell um, on, on the point of quality, especially when it goes more into general interest reporting? Or does everybody really have to nail down into an extreme niche? something like the information um, to, to cater to a very, very specific um, clientele that will be able to shell out the money. And, and can you share uh, what's this company and, uh, and your background real quick? Oh yeah, my, my company is called Fail Better Media and we started in 2013. And we, um, we started um, um, an online science magazine, uh, which was paid content, so we had a subscription model. And um, we ran out of money pretty quickly. <laughs> you say fail better. Fail better, from yeah. From the famous Sam Beckett. Yes. Never try right. it, ever fail. No yeah. Matter, try That's again, right. fail again, fail better. Yeah, the, that is the credo of the media entrepreneur <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and when, when we tried to, to raise funding from investors, it, it always came down to this, okay, but what is the pain you're solving? You said, yeah, we do it better than the others. And I said, ah, that's not enough. I think I would say one thing, and I think Josh would say the same as well, and you guys, but the problem we have sometimes speaking as media entrepreneurs is that we kind of make generalized statements that we think apply to everybody, when in fact the journey is so personal and deeply different for everybody. The big categories of difference are, are you B2B? Are you building like the pipes and the the foundations that make other people's businesses work, which I actually personally think is where the growth will be in media innovation right now for young startups is, are you fixing the problems um, that will allow the system to work um, versus thinking you're gonna be the next BuzzFeed? I think the idea of scaled mass audience startups um, trying to be Jonah Peretti, I don't think it's the time. I personally don't think so. I may be wrong. Maybe someone out there does have the next Mike BuzzFeed you know, whatever. But right now, I think it's not about necessary quality, but trust. So the way I see it right now, 
online media, digital media, is kind of like we all have these fastest cars imaginable, but we don't have any roads to drive them on. We don't have speed limits. We don't have traffic lights. We don't have someone maintaining the security of the system. And I really feel right now we've moved so fast, the destruction of the old business model, the old system of distribution of news, that the people who are going to be very successful are the people that make it easier for other businesses and premium users get better experiences out of their social web experience every single day, whether that is filtering, whether that is niche, like you say, I think there definitely is. I would dig deep, deep, deep into niches, whether it be meat <laughs> um, or it, it be some other passion that people have. And think about chemical reactions in people's brains, like dopamine. You know, the moment you find something new, there's a chemical that goes in your brain. It makes you feel good. Monetize those feelings, those emotions people have. So, yeah, that's my feeling. I may be completely wrong, and there may be someone else with a different experience, but I think right now it is the people building sometimes the unglamorous businesses that will be the next billion dollar media companies. It will come out of that as opposed to, you know, wa exploding watermelons and, you know, 50 million views for two second videos, which I think is not the way of the future. I, I, is there any other input? Maybe let, let's take more sure, yeah. um, interventions. Okay. Yeah, I, Curious to know... And, and please introduce yourself, oh, that sorry. would be great. Uh, my name's Ian Gill, I'm the president of a year three, we had our third birthday last weekend, a startup uh, called Discourse Media in Western Canada. Um, and we're about to go to investors, we've managed to survive so far without them, and we're terrified about valuation, so I'm curious about your experience in valuing what you built at whatever stage you'd built it even if it was just an idea, and how much you had to give up, you know, that conversation with investors, you know, what are you, you know, just... What, what kind of pricing? investors are you going to talk to? Uh, well, we're going to talk to some VCs, but we also have some, what I would call, sort of uh, social investors. Uh, there's some people we think we know, actually, are probably going to invest in us to some degree because of the social impact that we're hoping to create with yeah. our journalism, to the previous question, in a way. But the other thing is we were sort of nervously thinking we may also just talk to some sort of straight up VCs. Um, I'll say this with the proviso that I, I, I don't know about the company. Um, I, I think that um, the investors I'm most familiar with, VC investors, aren't going to want to take too much of your company to start. They want, they know that you'll, um, if you, they, they want to invest in a big company. They know that a big company needs to have um, multiple stages of uh, capitalization. They know that each stage of capitalization is going to dilute you or take more and more of your company. They know um, that by the end of it, you're not going to have um, a tremendous amount of the company left, which means that they know if at the start they take a tremendous amount of it, you'll have a vanishingly small amount at the end. And their worry at that point is that you won't be uh, motivated to... Uh, swing for the fences, as they say. So, I mean, without again, without knowing anything about the business and the metrics and the and the team and all that, my my uh, advice would be not to worry too much about the valuation. There are some sort of like uh, standard uh, places where you're going to be. I mean, uh, you know, you're probably looking at raising a million bucks or you know, 500k to 2.5 or something in there, and it's going to be for you know, 20 to 40 percent of the company or something like that, depending on your traction. Um, I, I would worry about a very long list of things, but I wouldn't worry about that. So uh, we only have uh, six minutes left, and I'd love to take as many questions as possible. Just uh, one, one quick word of advice. I see a lot of uh, hands going up in the room over here about people who want to set up a business. I quit a well-paying job as an EU correspondent for CNBC 10 years ago to set up a, a TV project in Brussels. I made some financing mistakes, uh, and you hear all the talks about equity, uh, but in Europe, there is a lot of debt financing, and the banks will give you money if you start getting a little bit of revenue. Uh, that's a trap to fall into, because once your business plan does not develop, you end up with maybe half a mortgage or more in debt that you will continue to have to pay off. The risks in developing your business, if you go into equity, the American model, the risk carrying money, like the funds that go into Storyful, or basically, if it fails, then that money is gone. You will not have debt 
coming into it. It's a, it's a word of advice from uh, the practice that I've had for the ten year, uh, last 10 years. I now have a good job in public relations, so I'm able to pay my debt. <laughs> but if you want to prevent that situation, uh, stay with equity and don't go into debt. So don't talk to your banks. I, I think it's great advice. And I do think while I would say, um, you know, fortune favors the brave, don't be stupid. Like, risks are risks, but they have to be calculated. You know, and one of the things you don't know is it's a mental game. You've got to take care of your family, the people that love you. You've got to know that they're on the journey with you as well. You've got to understand that, can you take it? Are you resilient? Can you take negative feedback? Can you take the 60 rejections? If you have any doubt, do not do it, right? And I sound like I'm here entirely, you know, very pessimistic, but I think you're absolutely right. So your journey, I think, is a brilliant example of um, I'm assuming you're glad you did it, even in retrospect. You learn from it, Definitely. right? But sometimes, you know, if the risk is so high that you're losing um, something very deep to your family, to your soul, to yourself, you know, have a second thought. Okay, so lo looks like we have uh, just one more question. Oh, I feel there's a lot of pressure on this now. <laughs> uh, I'm from the other side of the fence. I'm a director of uh, the Ferret, which is a cooperative. So we're, we're a startup, but we're not, we have no equity, so you can't buy into us. Uh, and we've been running a couple of years, reasonably successful, we just got a Google grant. But one of the questions I had, because coming from a co cooperative background, which is, this, I think this is going to be one other strand of media going forward will be cooperatives. How do you get journalists to think more like businessmen? Because for a cooperative to succeed, it also has to be a viable business. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to wrestle with myself over the last year and in, in, in the future. So just kind of wondering, as, as journalists who became businessmen, what's the advice for that? I think the opposite way you were taught, right? As journalists, we don't fail. We can fail. We go on the front page with the wrong story. Failure has a huge cost. You've got to suddenly turn your mind around thinking, well, actually, I've got to fail. The only lessons I will ever learn will be from failure. You will not learn from success. Success breeds, essentially, a, a real sense of, like, I don't know, I've only taken bad decisions when I've been succeeding. The other thing I would say as well is about being a journalist turned to a business person, it's about leadership. It's not about being a business person, it's about leadership, which is the idea that you are going to inspire people to do it for you. I built the team that built my company. I didn't build the company myself. So there is a certain amount of ego tempered by a realization that um, you're not there to do it all. You don't micromanage um, and you have to embrace failure uh, because that's the only way you'll, you'll sort of succeed in the end. Uh, these sound like platitudes, but you know they're real when you live them. Josh, you want to? I'd say that uh, if, if you're building a company, you need to be very, very modest about where you think you know it's going to go. Uh, you don't. Um, the way to build something that's very successful in three, four, five, ten years is by doing something good today and something a little better tomorrow and something a little better the next day. And what that means is that uh, it's extremely important not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, as they say. Do something uh, concrete today. So, love that. I also want to, uh, love to uh, finish up on some positive notes. Um, I, I think that being an entrepreneur is the most beautiful job on earth. Uh, I am, you know, now with Soto Company, I'm not an entrepreneur anymore. I've gained a lot of sleep and, uh, you know, a lot of health, uh, you know, a lot of uh, family time, uh, a lot of mind space. When I go to conferences, I'm no longer into my tunnel, you know, building the thing. I'm just like breathing. But God, how I miss, you know, <laughs> that be, uh, being, you know, at the center of the thing, getting the big picture and uh, building something. It's painful. It's very painful. It's risky. It's very risky. Uh, but it's, I think, the most beautiful thing on earth because you are building something. In our field especially, you are building something to change the way people consume news. It's just the most beautiful thing. So go out and change the world and uh, ci vediamo. Ciao.
Hi. 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 Hi.